55. I'm going to call the public works committee meeting uh, to order. It appeared uh, June 13th, 630 with uh, myself and Bernie Flynn and Sheila Vaccaro. Item number two, comments, suggestions, petitions by residents in attendance regarding items not on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll move on to item number three, presentation by the Chester County Health Department on mosquito-borne disease program. Hey, I'm Will. I'm not from the Chester County Health Department, but I'm going to tee this up for Andy here, who's from the Health Department. He's going to present to us. Um, as some of you will recall, prior to COVID, uh, mosquito, mosquito spraying was about as contentious as things got in Westchester. Um, we've been lucky since then. The weather has generally been not conducive to mosquito bring, breeding and uh, mosquito levels and West Nile levels have not reached a part, a point where we need to do uh, the truck mounted spraying. Um, I was going through meeting minutes from 2018. Um, this is before my time, so I, I don't actually remember it firsthand, but I was going through the, uh, the meetings and um, Looking at that, I thought it would be helpful to have the county come in and and tell us what what their uh, what their program looks like. Um, personally, professionally, uh, I'm an advocate for scaling back chemicals, pesticides in all use uh, all uses in our lives. Um, but I think there was a lot of misinformation out there in 2018 about the danger um, that that we were facing and um, how professional the county's uh, program was. Um, county staff at the time was uh, publicly accused of malfeasance uh, at one point, um, uh, not by anyone at the borough, but um, by residents uh, accused of manipulating data um, to justify spraying Westchester as some sort of retribution for publicly protesting the program. That's how bad it was in 2018. So I thought uh, a reset would be a good idea. Um, and the worst part about that was perhaps that, uh, not surprisingly, county staff stopped responding to us. Um, I remember in 2019, Mr. Flynn went to a commissioner's meeting uh, just to try to get acknowledgement of some of our concerns uh, because, um, you know, there was a, a an iron wall came down in, in terms of communications. Um, so fast forward a few years and a pandemic, um, the Andy hate, is that right? Hate? Hate. Uh, is um, running the program on mosquito-borne illness for Chester County. Um, he's been supplying the borough with mosquito larvicide to help keep our uh, populations down. He handles all the trapping. Um, if we need to spray, Andy will be responsible for that. Um, and uh, we had a good start to the year with dry weather up until yesterday. Um, so our populations have been manageable, um, but things could change moving forward to the summer. So again, uh, I thought it would be good to have the county come out here uh, ahead of any potential spraying that would happen this year and tell us about their program. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Andy. That would be awesome. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Um, as Will said, my name is Andrew Haight. I work for the Chester County Health Department. I'm an environmental health specialist in the uh, mosquito borne disease control program. Uh, I'm joined here tonight uh, by uh, Matt Skiljo. He's the uh, Bureau Director of the Environmental Health Protection Division at the, the Chester County Health Department. Um, some of you may be familiar with our program, some of you might not, um, but I'm here to just give you a a refresher, a sort of crash course or on, on the mosquito-borne disease control program. Uh, so in front of you, you have the slides um, as well as a few uh, handouts. So we'll get into it. Um, so a broad overview of what the mosquito-borne disease control program does. Uh, we receive funding from a grant by uh, Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection uh, to monitor and control mosquito populations in Chester County. Uh, with the ultimate goal of protecting the health of its citizens. Um, so what does that entail? Um, first and foremost, we, we monitor mosquito populations by uh, deploying uh, several varieties of mosquito traps targeting uh, adult mosquitoes. Um, 
Our two main types are gravid traps. They target uh, female Culex mosquitoes, which are the mosquitoes that transmit West Nile virus. Uh, gravid traps mimic um, conditions that are attractive to the females looking to lay eggs uh, and make more mosquitoes, um, which you can see in the, the first picture there. Um, 45 of those throughout the county, three of them every week we do in Westchester Borough. Um, another variety of traps that we, we deploy is a, what's called a host seeking trap. These are the traps targeting mosquitoes looking to bite humans. Um, so we use those two in combination to sort of determine what populations look like, what viral activity is like. Uh, we send those out to DEP to get tested uh, and identified so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, in addition, we monitor mosquito larval populations looking for standing water, you name it, catch basins, storm drains, retention ponds, uh, down to a bottle cap. Uh, a bottle cap's worth of water is enough to breed mosquitoes and serve as a larval habitat. Um, so that is an overview of our trapping program. Uh, we also do complaint response, uh, dealing with uh, mosquito-related complaints, whether that be swimming pools, tire piles, uh, general pop property maintenance issues, uh, and we enforce Chester County health re regulations. Um, we do dead bird sampling. West Nile virus circulates between the bird and the mosquito population. So if we find a dead bird uh, or a resident uh, reports that to us at the health department, we'll go out and collect a sample from it, see if it uh, was, if West Nile virus was the cause of the bird's death. Um, education and outreach what we're doing right now, uh, raising awareness for mosquito populations and the issues that they cause, uh, neighborhood canvassing, hand, and handing out literature, just raising awareness generally. Uh, and finally, uh, what we're here to talk about tonight, mosquito treatments. Um, so 90 to 95% of what we do is larval control of mosquitoes, which I, to use the word uh, shooting fish in a barrel, they're not going anywhere. They're right where we want them to be, um, and we use bacteria to do so. It's a soil, two different types of soil bacteria, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So 90 to 95 percent of what we do to control mosquitoes is at the larval stage. Um, very low risk, uh, easy going products, um, but there is that you know five to ten percent where we need to do adult mosquito control to bring down both populations and uh, viral activity. So we practice what's called integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, I like to think of it as a pyramid. Um, bottom of the pyramid is more preventative, uh, whereas the top of the pyramid is your higher risk and more intervention. Um, so the foundation of any good IPM program is cultural or education, uh, a lot of education and outreach, as I said, neighborhood canvassing, encouraging good habits amongst the, the community to minimize mosquito habitat and, and raise awareness. Uh, physical or mechanical control, that's our trap surveillance, collecting them, habitat reduction, getting rid of buckets, standing water, um, minimizing places for them to breed and make more mosquitoes. Regulatory, that's enforcement of our regulations or uh, borough regulations, uh, cooperating. Uh, this is a cooperative effort. Um, you know, we, we need to work together on this uh, as well as uh, between both municipal and county level, as well as county and state level. Uh, biological control, uh, that's the larval control using the bacteria that I had mentioned, as well as what's known as an in insect growth regulator. Uh, and then at the very top, uh, last resort uh, would be chemical control. So that's you know, think of it like the food pyramid. Your sugars are at the top, chemical control is at the top. Not used very often, best in low doses. Uh, so as I said, larval treatments, uh, I'm gonna talk about larval treatments, adult treatments, and uh, for barrier treatments, and truck mounted ultra low volume. So just to give you a general rundown, uh, to control larval mosquitoes, we treat standing water for the mosquito larvae uh, products contain uh, BTI, which is Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, uh, BS, which is Bacillus sphericus, uh, or a combination of both. Uh, BTI will kill any mosquito larvae in there without impacting other aquatic organisms. It's pretty much target specific to mosquito larvae. Um, sometimes we'll use what's known as a growth regulator. That's basically a, a, a mosquito, juvenile mosquito hormone that prevents them from going from their pupa phase to their adult phase. So they essentially uh, 
starve. Um, and that's how, that's how they, we control mosquitoes using that method. Um, it comes in a variety of styles. Um, the picture there shows uh, briquette formulations, which are uh, longer lasting usually, uh, anywhere from 30 to 180 days, depending on the product. Uh, they're pre-measured and treat a predetermined area, usually 100 square feet of surface area. Uh, these are great, gives us longer time between retreatments if we need to retreat at all. Uh, the little tea bag looking things there, those are water soluble pouches. So they're filled with granules uh, about the size of like a fertilizer pellet, but it's, it's basically corn cob chunks covered in this bacteria. The bag will dissolve and release those, those granules very similar to the, to the briquette formulation, but not quite as long lasting. Uh, and then finally, the little pile of pellets there is a, a gran granular formulation. That's best for your large areas, retention ponds, you know, drainage ditches, things where it makes more sense to get better coverage. Uh, usually those things are five to 20 pounds per acre, depending on activity level. Um, so this is our, our bread and butter. Uh, 90 to 95% of what we do is larval control. Uh, these are all safe uh, Soil bacterias, um, some of them, the one pictured there in the, the bag, the blue and white bag, that one is actually OMRI certified, so it is an organic product. Um, same with mosquito dunks, they are, they are certified for organic production. So, we have a lot of ground to cover, um, and larval control only goes so far sometimes. Um, and there are times where we would need to do a localized barrier treatment. So let's say one of our trap sites in the borough starts getting high numbers or starts testing positive weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. Um, we would do a barrier treatment. Think, uh, you know, your general pest control. Uh, so this would be localized to the detection site. Um, we would use a backpack mist blower, just like is seen in the, the image shown there. Uh, to apply a contact insecticide uh, to uh, harborage areas, dense foliage, um, overgrown vegetation, uh, to 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 knock the mosquitoes out when they seek places to rest uh, in those dense areas. Um, when we do that, we go out, we scope out the area, identify blooming flowers, which we skip over to prevent you know risk to pollinators. Um, uh, these products are generally effective for approximately two weeks, depending on weather conditions. Um, we don't spray in the rain or if rain is anticipated over the next 24 hours. Um, and in the heat of the summer, this product dries within an hour. Uh, at that point, once it is dry, it is safe to re-enter the area. Um, the two products that we use for such treatments are Suspend SC, which has an active ingredient of Delta Methrin. Uh, or FLIT 10 EC, uh, which contains permethrin. That's used for, you know, hunters use that to treat their clothes to keep ticks and mosquitoes away from them while they're out in the woods, or campers will use that for their, their tents and, and their equipment while they're hiking or camping. Um, and all of these labels can be made available uh, at your request. So uh, I, I'd be happy to provide those to you and walk you through if you have any questions about, about how to interpret the label. Um, our final step, um, if we're having weeks of positives, very high numbers, uh, and we've, you know, tried to identify as many larval sites that we can treat as possible, populations are coming down, viral activity isn't coming down, our last resort is to perform a truck-mounted ultra-low volume spray. So ultra-low volume means a very small volume of the product applied over a, a large area. Uh, the product we use, Zenovex, is applied at 1.5 fluid ounces per acre. So if you imagine your, your standard shot glass uh, full of liquid over an entire football field, it's a very small amount over, over a very large area. Uh, Zenovex E4 RTU uh, is ready to use. RTU means ready to use. There's no mixing. There's no guesswork. It's pre-measured and ready to go. We just put it in the, in the truck and go. Um, it's classified as reduced risk. Uh, the active ingredient Edifenprox is actually used in, uh, I believe it's Hart's uh, flea and tick medication for dogs and cats. Uh, 
whereas that the heart's flea and tick medication is 50% active ingredient that we're putting directly on an animal, Zenovex E4RTU is only 4%, so 4% versus 50% um, being applied. It's not, our, it's not an organophosphate, non-carbamate, non-ester pyrethroid, um, uh, and it's, it's effective for mosquito control and uh, has a very low toxicity profile. On the sheet that I provided you, there's a, a fact sheet about Zenovex showing that compared to other substances. Far and away, uh, caffeine is more hazardous than what we are uh, using to treat for mosquitoes. Um, our sprayer, our spray equipment, which we'll get into in a second, it's calibrated annually to, deter, uh, to ensure that the droplets are the appropriate size for that product uh, between 10 and 30 microns. We do that every single year to make sure that our machine is running as it is intended um, to stay within the label. Uh, and the sprayer modulates its output based on the truck's speed. So if we're moving faster, uh, it will put out more to compensate. We're covering more area in a shorter time. It's going to be putting out more to catch up to us. If we're slowing down, uh, it's going to put out less because we're not moving quite as fast. And if we do stop, it will shut off completely until we resume treatment. Um, so just a basic breakdown of what our truck spray, I apologize for the crudeness of my diagram here. Uh, this is basically what our truck sprayer is. Uh, in the bed of the truck, that's the Clark Promist Dura. Uh, this, this sprayer is probably the smartest sprayer that I've ever worked with uh, by far. So the sprayer itself works in conjunction with the smart flow box, which that's me in the cab of the truck during the treatment, turning it on and off. Uh, it's monitoring how much we're applying. It's keeping track of that so we can report it out. Uh, there's three preset rates uh, that we can select through. We, have, we usually just set it at 1.5 fluid ounces per acre. And that talks between the sprayer and this Mesa 3 tablet. It's it basically our, our onboard computer. While we're doing the treatment, it's plotting a map showing where the sprayer is on and off. Uh, it's identifying hazards as points and putting out a buffer for uh, beehives, apiaries, or hypersensitives. And it is constantly logging treatment info in real time that we can export and report back to you at the municipality uh, upon completion of the treatment. And it's constantly modulating as we're moving to make sure that we are staying within that label rate. Takes all the guesswork out of it. So, if the need to perform a truck mounted ULV spray would arise, Westchester Borough would be presented with a report of this uh, upon completion of the treatment. So if you see here, you'll see the swath, the wide green lines indicate where the sprayer is on. Um, the red dotted line, very narrow line is showing where the sprayer is off. Purple points are apiaries or hypersensitive individuals. Uh, and you can see a very clear buffer around these points where the sprayer was turned off. There's a stream uh, right in this area. Uh, this is school property. We, we give a buffer to schools. Um, so at the end of the treatment, if the need were to arise, you'd be presented with a map showing where, what areas were treated, as well as this, this is a, a readout of how much was used, how many acres were covered, showing that if we can calculate by hand and confirm that the sprayer is putting out exactly that 1.5 ounces per acre. Um, so, so when we do a truck spray, uh, there are many precautions that CCHD takes to ensure the safety of the public. Um, all treatments, regardless of larva, adult, barrier spray, you name it, they're all performed by CCHD personnel, uh, me. Um, we're fully licensed by the PA Department of Agriculture. Uh, we, we have a poor certification in Category 16 certification, which is a public health and invertebrate pests. Additionally, I'm a, I am have a degree in environmental science. Uh, I know the consequences and, you know, what can happen if these products are not used properly. Um, and we have a combined experience of approximately 30 years between myself and some of the other applicators in, in the health department that assist me when the need to treat arises. Um, 
selection of safer products, no organophosphates, uh, no products containing piperinol butoxide, which is a, a synergist that helps other insecticides work better, uh, for the lack of a better term. Uh, and the, the product we use as we're doing the treatment, it doesn't have a residual effect like what, you know, what you would get for general pest control on your house. Some of those products can have a two week residual effect to up to three months. Basically, once that cloud dissipates, uh, it's only targeting the mosquitoes that are actively flying at that time. Um, and once that cloud is gone, especially once the sun rises, it starts to break down very rapidly in, in sunlight. Uh, there's no residual effect for the risk for pollinators is basically non-existent. Um, the timing of our treatments, uh, we commence treatments at dusk, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, at that time, honeybees uh, are not present. Uh, they use, honeybees use the sun to navigate back to their hive. Um, if they're not back in the hive by then, they just kind of drop. Uh, so there's no no pollinators active at that time, but that's when the Culex mosquitoes that transmit West Nile are most active. Uh, so this minimizes our risk to our non-target uh, non target insects. Uh, we have a leader truck ahead of the spray truck calling out turns, calling out hazards. Um, if there's someone walking on the street, they uh, pull up to them, uh, tell me in the spray truck to turn it off, hang tight for a second, and they uh, kindly ask the the people walking to to return to their homes, just for their for their own safety, uh, to let them know that the sprayer is coming through. Um, they'll have a megaphone um, in case you know there's a group of people. That way we can communicate effectively. Um, prior to any treatment, we contact hypersensitive individuals who may be. Um, their health may be impacted by use of pesticides or exposure, uh, as well as beekeepers, 12, uh, no less than 12, but no more than 72 hours prior to the treatment. And this is any of those individuals, hypersensitives or beekeepers that fall within 500 feet of the treatment area. And additionally, we, we provide buffers to schools, streams, and waterways just for protection of uh, these aquatic habitats. Uh, public communication, um, prior to any treatment, we, we complete a Pima spray plan um, that has my contact info, our business unit number, where we're going to spray, where we're going to stage to do the spray, approximate start time, a number of different information, uh, which I could send you an example if, you, if you'd like to see something like that. Um, we would notify the municipality would be the first to know um, if we're even considering doing it. Uh, we'll be sending out regular notifications to Westchester Borough throughout the season, what our trap numbers look like, what our viral activity looks like, just to keep everybody in the loop. Uh, we're shooting to uh, start rolling them out uh, within the week or so, um, and it would be every week between now and end of September. Uh, we would issue a press release uh, no less than 48 hours prior to the treatment, uh, which we would present on our website, our social media, uh, as well as uh, Ready Chesco alerts announcing to the treatment. Uh, I would encourage everybody, if you haven't already, to to sign up for Ready Chesco alerts. Uh, again, directly contacting registered apiaries and hypersensitives. Um, we would be posting signage, uh, yard signs at key entry points to the treatment area, um, indicating the date and start time. Uh, and then upon completion, we would provide you with with a report letting you know that we completed the treatment or let's say it started to rain halfway through, we would let you know that we ceased treatment and we would pick up on another night uh, for our intended rain rain day. Um, so I said before, this is a cooperative effort. Um, we all have to work together on this. Uh, the best way to do that, um, you know, keeping in touch, sharing information, send things to me, hey, there's a big puddle of standing water somewhere, do you mind go check it out and treating it? Or uh, it could go either way, like uh, I could say, hey, do you guys mind helping this property get cleaned up with, with uh, some property maintenance ordinances? Um, I did see just this morning a Westchester Public Works truck at the GSC. Um, I understand that a uh, Public Works employee was taking their pesticide applicator exam which would be a massive help. Um, getting more staff certified as public applicators would be a major help and reduce the, the need to do any more than your standard larval treatment. Um, so the more, the more larval treatments going out there, the better. 
I saw a whole stack of mosquito dunks out on the, the front desk there. That's what I like to see. The more people putting these products out there, the better. Um, education, we can provide mosquito related materials. I have a stack of several different uh, uh, informational handouts that I'll leave at the back uh, on the back table here for anybody in attendance to pick up on their way out. Uh, friendly reminders to the borough residents, tip over that bucket, get rid of the anything that could be holding water, reduce the mosquito breeding habitat, um, and just generally reduce their exposure, um, protect yourselves uh, with repellents, uh, even getting mosquito traps, uh, all to keep ourselves uh, safe from mosquito-borne disease, especially West Nile virus. And um, if the need arises to, to do a barrier, just barrier treatment or a truck mounted treatment, assist us. Uh, we're here to help, uh, but at the same time, we also need your help to facilitate this and make sure everything goes smoothly and keep everybody safe. So with that, I probably went over time and I thank you all for your time. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them either either here or wherever. One question. Yeah. How, how do you identify home beekeepers? So through Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, there's a hypersensitive and apiary search that we as applicators, we have to check that. every If we are doing anything above ground, we have to check that and make sure that we're within or without that 500 feet. Uh, but you you have to be a certified applicator to do so. So uh, I'd be happy to walk you through it at some point. Uh, but basically, I could put in my spray location, and I could put I think as low as it goes is a mile. But anything within that mile will pop up and show me where a hypersensitive individual is or a, a beehive. So that's how we we find those. Uh, those individuals and contact them and send them all the relative information that we need to send. Um, or I could just narrow it down to Westchester Borough and then every single beehive in Westchester will pop up for me with contact info so I can reach out to those individuals. You find them. How are you finding the beekeepers? It's a PA Department of Agriculture database. Uh, so they have any beekeeper has to register with the state. Um, I actually used to work with a state apiarist, um, so she'll come out and inspect hives or if there's mortality issues, um, let's say a hive just completely completely dies, she'll come out and inspect and try and determine what's going on. So they are registered with the state. Thank you. Yeah. Very informative. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. One question, if you don't mind. Yes. What does BTI and all of the other biologicals do to bat? Populations. To what populations? Bats. Bats? Bats. No effect whatsoever. Um, BTI, like, it can be used in horse feed troughs, uh, uh, rain barrels. If a bat were to drink from water that, beats, that has been treated with BTI, it won't even know it's there. It will, it will have no impact on, on the bat population. If you would all state your name and, and address, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. John Cottage, 532 North Church Street. And uh, I do think it's a good idea to control the mosquitoes, so I don't want to speak against that. But in this day and age, when it's difficult to hire people, this seems like it's reasonably sophisticated equipment. How are the operators trained and certified ahead of use and what is the supervisory standard in terms of frequency of reviewing the results from the vehicles? Excuse me, John, could you spell your last name, please? Like a house. Cottage. Lighthouse? Lighthouse? Like a house. Oh, like a house. Cottage, C-O-T-T-A-T-E. <laughs> I'm spelling lighthouse and cottage house. Thank you. So your question is, how are staff trained on the use of this, this equipment? Yes, Certified. So to be a certified applicator, you have to take a two written exams, the core, which is more general broad. Uh, that could be anything from lawn care to cleaning your equipment to performing the treatments. You name it as far as like personal protection, it's in there. Uh, and then a second for each category, if there's 26 categories that you can get certified in from anywhere from termites, turf and lawn to swimming pools, believe it or not. Um, 
So that's how they are legally able to do these treatments in the public. Uh, as far as the use of the equipment, the manufacturer provides um, all sorts of training modules. Uh, Frontier Precision is the, the company that makes the, the tablet and that uh, the software that's used in the tablet. Uh, Clark Mosquito Control is the, the manufacturer of the sprayer. They have resources available as well. And our rep, uh, our sales rep will actually come out and demonstrate for any new staff. Um, and additionally, DEP will do, uh, they call it the Mosquito Academy. Uh, every, oh, it just happened the other week. I was unable to attend, but usually end of May, uh, they'll have all the counties come together, any new staff especially, and they'll sort of go through the motions of how to operate this machinery. Uh, and then for the first few times, uh, for new, new county coordinators, a DEP biologist will actually come out and assist with the first few treatments just to get everybody up to speed and, and do a refresher, even if, you know, someone who's been here for a couple of years needs one. Um, so there are, there are measures in place to make sure everybody knows what they're doing with equipment. So. Another question. Yeah. Uh, can, just working. Yeah, test test. Uh, Don Brazen, four, two, three West Neal street. Uh, I was, uh, uh, chair of the Public Works Committee for eight years, and I was on the, actually on the board of the, uh, the, the Westchester Green Team. Uh, question is probably not so much for you, but for the borough. Uh, a number of years ago, um, I had the was able to get the borough to do larva sliding, and we had a, a fellow that was uh, very imaginative in finding standing water. I got to give him a lot of credit. Plus, I also found the businesses uptown were usually pretty cooperative. If you found standing water so it's a question of who's we don't that guy's not here anymore so it's a question of who's going to do the dunking again i know that's not your responsibility necessarily but in in the borough um are we going to resume that because we haven't done it in two years sure sorry um Good question. We talked about a next step following tonight is that Andy come down and sit with our public works team and uh, we revisit. Um, we also had a West Nile abatement program in from 2018 or 2019. You're right. That was spearheaded by staff that's no longer here. So we want to uh, dust that off and get going again. And uh, we'll have a follow up meeting with uh, staff and Andy to, to get going. Uh, also, it. Um... I think we need to get the word out. What, what we've done in the past is um, the county has provided dunks for us. And for a couple of years anyway, I was distributing them. You know, the public works would get the message and I'd take them to someone's house. Perfectly willing to do that again. But um, um, are we going to, oh, there we go. Yeah, available, any ACE hardware. Oh, you still have me. Yeah, I saw a box the last time I was there. Um, but. I think we need to get the word out that they're available um, and uh, to make it easy for people to get them. Yeah, okay. And they are available fairly cheap. They might be $10 on Amazon. You can buy them in a hardware store if for some reason they run out. Uh, or alternatively, I'll leave a, a sack of my business cards in the back. I'll give you one directly. If you have folks that are in need for some reason, Reach out to me. I'll, I'll drop some. Well, they're they're free with us. That's true. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, but they're also they're also free through me. So I'd be happy. Oh, okay. To good. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you again. Good evening. Moving on to item four. Monthly reports. Start with public works. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Um, if you could just go to the uh, PowerPoint, uh, Bill. I have uh, some pictures to show you. Okay. Um, so just not too many pictures, but uh, um, as you probably saw over the last 10 days, we started paving like all over uh, Pico, Aqua. Um, this is the, uh, that was the Mayfield, West Virginia area. Um, but it's, it's all over right now. Finally getting to high street. You probably saw, yeah. um, we, uh, installed a new roof at, uh, hoops park. 
uh, did it in house and uh, thought it turned out uh, thought it turned out well. Um, planting trees, um, not going as fast as I'd like, but uh, but we're still planting and watering. <clears throat> um, we uh, put uh, wayfinding signs for uh, the uh, theater. Uh, this is one sign, and and that's another, so that they can all go there. And I, I thought this was a home run. I thought it really looked nice. Uh, last three, um, our sewage spill. This is uh, this is when they started cleaning up the sewage spill. Um, next one. This was later in the day. You'll see that uh, most of it was uh, cleaned up. And then the final uh, photo. That's the last one. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Well, anyway, there's uh, this morning the it looked like a, a normal stream. So we got to that point right there. Um, and with that, uh, be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. good, good evening. The, uh, have we found the source of the, uh, the, 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 the breakage? No, uh, what we've done is we've, um, we've got a lot of information. Uh, we've televised the storm sewers. We think that we've narrowed the problem area um, to an area uh, in the downtown business district, uh, maybe Chestnut, Chestnut Street, High Street, Gay, St uh, Gay St Street areas. And uh, we're about to start doing the hard part, which is trying to test to see, um, you know, which which uh, pipes are stormwater and which ones are uh, are not that are going into our, our our storm sewer. One thing I want to mention is uh, we have no evidence that this is like bathroom waste. Uh, this is um, gray water, which I would define as um, like from washing machines, uh, that kind of thing. But but it's there's no uh, bathroom waste, which uh, which I think is also uh, also a good thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, so one thing, the MS4 testing. Yes. That we had discussed last week that there that there was some fecal call for them and right. testing from years ago. Right. Is that not That's, true? That is accurate. Uh, I think it was 2019. Um, it did test positive for fecal coliform down there at that outfall. Um, but it's my understanding that the next testing uh, did not show any contamination. And it could be just the difference of timing. You know, the day before, maybe there was a rainstorm and kind of washed everything out. And and that could be the difference between a positive test and a, and a negative test. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to wastewater. Good evening, Sean Mitchell, the superintendent of Goose Creek Wastewater Plant. Uh, I only have a couple pictures. Uh, at Taylor Run this month, the past month, employees drained, pressure washed, and cleaned out their chlorine contact tanks. Uh, they finished, uh, Actually, both plants finished their DEP proficiency testing for the lab accreditation and uh, both passed and still are uh, accredited for another year. Uh, they are training two new employees at the time of the plant, and I believe at this time, the third one just started the last one. So wastewater is now fully staffed. Uh, Goose Creek. During a daily inspection at the pump station at Miner Street on a Saturday morning, rainy Saturday morning, they found uh, one of the pumps had a high amp draw. Um, I got the privilege of being called and called out uh, due to people being away for the weekend. Um, we pulled the pump and found broken ears. The picture's up, Bill. Uh, that's cleaning the contact tanks at Taylor Run. Uh, that is us redoing a clarifier that's a little later. I don't know what happened to the third one. Uh, there's ears that hold the pump on the rails and the flanges. Uh, one was actually broken. One was cracked. Um, we found that just over time, vibration turned on and off. It broke. 
Uh, we pulled the pump, replaced the ears, replaced the flange, put it back within an hour. Uh, so that was all done in house. Um, crews pulled the last of the four inspe uh, mixers in inspection. Uh, all of them were sandblasted, painted, bearings and lip seals replaced and reinstalled online. Uh, a coolant heater uh, was replaced on the College Avenue pump station generator. Uh, as the, pick the one picture showed, we took two clarifiers offline. Uh, that would be not the right one. Uh, that one. We'll drain the tanks. We'll inspect the bottom. We'll flush the lines out. Um, one had all new bottom seals and steel replaced uh, with new bolts. We actually had to adjust uh, torsion bars to adjust the balance of the arms. Uh, they were all done within three weeks. We took them down, inspected them, cleaned them, replaced what we had to put back online. Uh, we tried to do that in that section with college down. So we will be doing that with another, hopefully two clarifiers this summer. Uh, let's see, the maintenance crew tore down two mono pumps, uh, replaced them, painted them, um, and did the proficiency test. So that's a month. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Bruce. Moving on to parks and recreation. Hello, Keith Kurowski, director of the parks and recreation department. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you can see there from the report, uh, the month of May, month of May, we really pick up in activities, programming events. Uh, we had a concert in the park, uh, Fugit Park right out back. Uh, we had a movie, movie in the park in Marshall Square Park. And I can't talk about this event here that's on my chest because that happened in June. So I'll talk about that next month. But the Turks Head Festival was awesome. I'll get more to that next month. Uh, the main two things I wanted to talk about as per my report were the capital projects. The first one I'd like to start with is the Story Walk. And Victoria Dow is here to speak more about that. But the one thing I want to touch on really quickly, they had a they did not receive the grant they wanted to from the PA library system. So they got one from the Chester County library system. This is no way change what we're doing, their relationship with the borough, everything's moving on as par for the course. And as what the committee asked from Parks and Rec and the libraries, you wanted approval of the books that would be put on display. So Victoria's here to speak more about that. Actually, the money is coming from the Chester County Health Department. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we did, we did order the frames, um, which, uh, thank goodness public works has said that they will accept since we don't have any loading docks or anything like that. Um, they should be coming in beginning of July. So I'm hoping that, you know, depending on, um, how long it takes to just lay out the walk itself and public works schedule to actually install the posts and put the frames on top and then we'll have the book pages ready to go because that's something that we can do beforehand and the first book that we picked is one that has been used in story walks um it's called senorita mariposa um it's uh the basically a story of a monarch butterfly and their um their journey from North America back down to, to Mexico, which is really a pretty amazing journey. And there is evidently in each um, season's worth of monarch butterflies, there's one generation that's known as the super generation that actually makes that 3000 mile trip. And they can go about 60 miles in a day. And they, um, they rely on milkweed and other plants to feed on along the way and of course part of the world that we're in is a breeding place for them and i was happy that last summer we had some caterpillars in our yard busily eating milkweed which was really fun so this is by um a guy by the name of ben gunders gunders gundersheimer um also known as Mr. G, and he's won awards. And uh, this is, it's the format is actually, it is, it is a song and it's um, 
you can see up there, it's, it's in English with Spanish underneath, and on some pages it's reversed. The Spanish is in the larger letters and, and English underneath. So this is something that should um, appeal to a pretty wide population in our community. Um, and it, it really takes you through the whole journey of where, where these monarch butterflies go. So, so the process now is we actually um, will take this down to Market Street printing. We have two copies. The bindings have to be cut off. Um, and then the pages are laid out and laminated. And of course, you have to have two copies because you know you have the back back side of the pages as well. And I think the other thing that we will be doing is working with um, the Friends of Hoops Park to actually lay out where the walk will be. I had a conversation with Craig Steiner today, and he had some pretty pertinent observations about um, the conditions in Hoops Park at different times. And I think he knows the park well enough that he can really help us, you know, say, yeah, this is probably the best place to, to, to put this. Be about a quarter of a mile with about 19 stops. So we'll have an introductory page that will basically say this is what this is and this is who has funded and supported this. So, you know, we'll have Bro um, logo on there, the health department and the library, um, and then, you know, indicate, okay, go on to the next stop and walk your way through. So, any questions? Thank you. Presumably they will be not near the, the foul ball trajectories. I don't think so. <laughs> and just uh, to make sure that is, is that a 3 0 recommendation from the committee? Thank you. Uh, the next item I wanted to talk about is the recreation and mass parks plan update. Um, we're lagging a little this and it, it's for a good reason uh, and working with uh, Bill DeGuffroy from the Chess County Planning Commission and our will be consultant, we want to make sure we're putting the steps in place that we're not jeopardizing any future funding from the VPP grant. Uh, with that said, the VP grant, the VPP grant, which has been applied for numerous times by our consultants and they've gotten, they've been awarded that from different municipalities numerous times. We're very confident that we're going to get the grant. We've been instructed by the county that we should definitely apply for this grant, but we're just a little behind in our time frame of what we want to do moving forward. So I have another meeting with the, uh, the consultants on Thursday to make sure we have our ducks kind of more lined up. But I would anticipate us getting started with the granting process relatively soon and shortly thereafter the, the first phase of the study, which is basically the information gathering stage of the analysis of what we have and then moving forward. Just wanted to keep you abreast of where we stand on that. Things, there's no change to the cost. There's no change to anything except for the timeline slightly. I'm going to mention that I have been approached by more than one resident requesting that we add a skate park to the master plan. Uh, again, that's literally what this process is all about. Whether we want this, when we want that, this is going to be the time for everyone to come out and say, I want this, my neighborhood wants that. And then we'll have the, the vetting process there within. This is what we've been looking forward to for years. And again, that kind of gets piecemealed yearly, quarterly, whatever it comes and goes. But this is the process. This is where we're going to figure out what the wants are, what we can afford, where the money's coming from, where are the grants, and how are we going to lay that out? You know, long, short term, medium term, long term goals. Uh, and again, it'll be support from the borough in general that, hey, we're putting this plan together. This is our guiding light for the next decade or more and how we want to get these projects done. Again, we have a lot of aging parks that need help. We have a lot of parks that don't have friends groups that need a little bit more assistance than the ones that do. And this is this is going to get us there. I'm very confident. I'm very anxious to start the process, but I want to make sure the borough is getting as much funding for the, the, cons the, consult the consultation aspect moving forward. And if there's any request for input from any of the skaters in the community, feel free to reach out and I will Put them through to you or to whoever it is appropriate. Yes, yeah, so there, there will be numerous, numerous public meetings gathering in, input. There'll be surveys online, social media. Uh, our consultants will be coming to some of our larger events and doing kind of pop up surveys or pop up uh, information gathering sessions. Again, we want to make sure that 
everyone has their opportunity to express their opinions, their wants, their, their likes, their dislikes moving forward. Okay. Are you finished with your report? Yes, sir. Great. Bill, can you put the picture up for uh, Hoops Park, the steps? Yes, sir. All right. Earlier today, I was driving, doing my rounds around the borough, taking a look before the meeting, uh, and I stumbled upon a, a white staircase to heaven uh, that's in the parking lot to uh, Hoops Park. And I went, well, I can't say it because Dana won't print it. But anyway, I saw this thing and I said, well, uh, we, we, there's, there's a couple of problems that we sit here. So I talked to building and housing. I talked to Keith. I talked to Mr. Metric. And uh, the baseball team did everything they were supposed to do. They got permits. They got footer inspections and, and all that stuff. So, which is all good. The surface is non-slip. If you fall, you're going to really uh, tear up your hands because they, they did a very good broom finish. But currently, right now, we have two issues with what's, what's there. Uh, the trip hazard where the, I love how PA1 put the arrow so it tells you you're going to trip uh, going up the steps. So you're going to crack your forehead on the first step. But anyway, uh, we should actually, I believe. Have them fill it in? <laughs> no, no. I Well, that's Mr. Edwards is the engineer. Uh, I believe what we should do is probably tape up this area till the handrails are installed because it's a safety hazard right now. Uh, because there's nothing to grab onto going up, up do. down those steps. And then when you get to the top of the steps where the baseball thing is, there's a, the very top is a piece of plywood. We were there this morning. Yep. Yeah. It's a slip, slip thing too. But, um, uh, I'm sure, you know, Mr. Metric and Mr. Edwards will come up with a great solution. How to take care of the, uh, uh, the elevation change, uh, in that, in that area. But right now it's a tripping hazard and. Uh, and there's nothing for anybody to grab onto. Uh, to the mayor's point earlier, she talked about ADA. I did walk around to the left hand side of the grass, and there is a there is a access walkway which ADA you know they can come across the top, you know, so that you actually can from the left hand side, you could actually access the baseball field that way yeah. through the uh, walkway that we put in. Right. Yeah. But the uh, uh, for safety. Uh, I, I hope you agree with me that we should barricade this thing so nobody uses it and falls. I don't disagree. It's, it's, it's on our property. Gotcha. No, understood. And I, I, I caught some of the previous meeting, and I know there's a, a lot of questions, concerns when it comes to the, the players and where they park and the balls, and I can understand all those. But it's not a parks and rec issue when it resolves around parking. It's an enforcement issue. I, I, we, we've done many things over there. We said, hey, don't park in the park. Stay out of the grass. They don't park in the grass anymore. They got somewhere to go. Um, the balls, I understand someone coming onto your property to get a ball. No one wants you coming on their property. I think the players should be more polite or at least asking in that in that fashion. Um, not to just keep reverting back to the plan, but that's something we'll be discussing. And I think I heard that, you know, there's a, there's a potentially no parking issues or, or permitted parking. Uh, a potential, you know, solve would be instead of making the, the, the potential netting bigger or the overhang of the the uh, backstop bigger. What if there's a a small think of think of a surface or excuse me a circus tent made of mesh that goes over the parking lot. Four four poles on the corners and one in the middle, something similar. I've seen that at different ballparks where they protect where the ballparks are like this in a diamond shape. I've seen that. It's actually one of Berks County it looks similar to that. Different ideas can be addressed for these particular issues, and I think this. This update to our plan will address that in, in, in multiple fashions, hopefully, so we can figure out what's best for us. At, at the present time, I think we have a, if you look at the steps, yeah. look over your shoulder, yep. well, we, we have a safety issue at this point. Taken care of. Thanks. Certainly. I have a question since sure. this, this came up. Do, so do we have with the various leagues or teams that are using us some kind of agreement, you know, here are the guidelines and the, the rules of the road for. Yes, know? and this is the only one that's separate. Um, this is again because they've been using the field since 1956. They basically take care of everything with inside of the fence line of the park. Who is they? The adult baseball league, and that mainly refers to they take care of the mowing for the most part. This is completely separate. Does not pertain to that particular agreement. So they basically take care of the mowing, and they do that at a cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to twelve thousand dollars a year that the borough doesn't have to take care of. 
Uh, they maintain it very well as best they can. Um, and they would like to do more. Uh, they don't have deep pockets at the league. They would like to rebuild the basketball, or excuse me, the basketball. They would like to rebuild the dugouts. They'd like to do something with the parking. They don't enjoy having to park two blocks away either. Um, they're, they're trying to do their best to accommodate. I don't think anyone there, and again, I'm not there. I don't live there. That is, is completely ill-willed, but they're, they're following a lot of our recommendations and, and they're trying to be helpful. And I said, we can't, I can't tell them that they can't park on a spot that is open to public parking. I've insisted, I've asked, I've encouraged that do your best to accommodate the residents. And again, the, the, the leagues and players change from year into year out. I, I speak with one or two gentlemen a year. And we, tr we try the best to accommodate the neighbors in that, in that neighborhood. Um, I think, uh, as was discussed earlier, once we have the issues resolved with, and it's, it really resolves around the balls going in the parking lot, if we can resolve that issue, I think a lot of the other problems will kind of go away. Mr. McCoy, if, if I may, I, I'd like to go back to the steps. So we had the Friends of Hoops Park request permission to put a meadow up. We had per requests to put the bat box and the owl box up. I don't remember the steps coming before council for approval. Yeah. And I just heard Mr. Kurowski say that they have permission for anything inside the fence. This is outside the fence. Right, no, understood. And it's that's completely on me. as Because it was a permitted process through the Building and Codes Department, I thought it would be on smart growth. And therefore, I didn't bring it through these channels. It obviously was not, and that's a mistake on my part. Uh, again, it was paid for at the complete cost of the, the Adult Baseball League. Uh, I had had a conversation with Mr. Metric. I bring virtually everything before the rec commission, before the committee, and before council, and this was a mistake on my behalf. I, I'm in the park every day. I haven't seen these steps yet because I haven't been on the baseball side, but I... I'm not impressed. I'm hoping that there's going to be some improvements because I'm fairly sure that this would not have happened in Everhart or Marshall Square Park. Any other questions? Thank you. Follow up on it for a second. Mr. Uh, can you please uh, ask the, someone uh, to come up with a plan now to correct the the elevation issue that we have there. Uh, so, uh, as Ms. Dorsey mentioned, the uh, uh, if we just put handrails up there, it still looks it's still a tripping hazard and and uh, looks unfinished. And handrails aren't going to finish it up. Believe me, it just looks unfinished. So, will do. Do you agree, Ms. Dorsey? You're being very polite, so yes, I agree. I'm sure I'll have more comments next week. Thank you. You got it. Mr. Cottage. Thank you. <laughs> John Cottage, 532 North Church Street. Um, today, at the Hirshhorn Manor, which used to be called the Barclay, construction started on a large back parking lot. And that lot is uh, next to Barclay Park. So it took us a long time, about three years of packed council meetings, a lot, of, uh, a lot of people signing up on the petition and generating a lot of money from uh, the county and the state to get that park established. And it's not clear where the boundary line is on the park, except for at the moment, there is a, a hedge that runs down. So I can only assume that that's about the boundary line. But part of the old driveway from uh, the Hirshhorn Manor crosses over the park. And while we wouldn't ask for that to be rectified normally, since they are now putting in a new parking lot, I would just like to get some um, some word from the council that they will not be allowed to continue to use part of the park as part of their driveway and they will move the driveway over and hopefully be good neighbors enough to take away the old part of the driveway that is in the park so that the park is whole as it should be um, 
So I assume this is the appropriate. Actually, smart growth is, yeah. is where this came up before the smart growth committee, which is tomorrow evening, I think is where the, uh, the plan review came up after it went okay. through planning commission. But it's not part of the road. This is part of the park. Mr. Lynch, is this the one, the driveway that you were talking about at Smart Growth back in the time? This is the original driveway for the house that goes up under the portico. And this has all been talked about in Smart Growth with Mr. Walsh and uh, Mr. O'Connell. And uh, that's under Smart Growth. So you're correct, Mr. Uh, McCoy. Yeah, my, my recollection is that the, the plan, did they ask for a variance? I, I don't recall off, offhand. But... But this has gone through the planning commission and went through through council. Okay, just seems like it's park business because it's on the park, and I'm not sure why we would be giving a uh, a business the right to put a road in the park when they're actually doing the work to put in the parking lot. And it seems like it wouldn't be difficult just to put the road in the right place or driveway. What you're saying makes sense. It's just that I have zero insight into what you're saying, whereas smart growth has the awareness of the plan. Okay. Yeah, we're, we'll have to take a look at the, the plan. I don't recall the, the details. This came up probably, I don't know, three okay. months ago or something. Keith, do you know anything about it? Uh, regarding the issue that was taking place today with uh, contractors on the private side, interfering on the public side, the park, the Barclay Park. It's, it's the old driveway cuts across part of the park. Are you talking about it comes from uh, the corner of, I guess it'd be Marshall and High that you said walkway, not, not the driveway. Church Street side. There's the road through the carport. Okay. And and they're still using it? North Church and goes to the well, pretty good style parking lot. Okay. And are they using our park to like kind of back up and move around or? No, we just want assurance that they're not going to put in the new driveway right over the top of the old driveway, which actually goes into the park. I, I mean, I think we could, I mean, just off the top of my head, I'm thinking we could work with our GIS team and make sure that we're staking out our property lines to make sure that they're not crossing them. I mean, that. I don't see that would be much of a, an issue on our end. I, I can't imagine it be that difficult for our GIS department to do it and our public work guys to stake it. I mean, it's a couple of stakes in the ground, but to enforce that would come from building and codes to make sure that nothing's coming across from the private to the public. Okay, I'll give you close tomorrow. Please do. Thank you. Bill Lynch, 526 North Church Street. I live next to him, cottage. Um, so just to clarify a few things, we, so yes, it went through smart growth, the decisions were made, the plans were accepted and so on and so forth. But we did raise this issue. I think, uh, Mr. McCoy with, with the, I forget his name, but the, the zoning officer, um, uh, yeah, we were there looking at the plans and I pointed out that where the hedge line comes across, which we believe is the property line. Um, that a part of the driveway goes through the park just as, as a legacy thing, but it's only legacy because it used to all be one property. And so there's a, there's a piece of the driveway that's no wider than this, but it's wider, it's wider than this, right? So it's part of the park. And the question is, or I think the question that John is raising is that can we just have that adjusted to not be part of the park, right? Is that? A fair statement of that. Um, I'm not sure you said it the way you meant it, Bill, but it's so that the park would not be used for the driveway for a commercial building. Right. Currently, where the driveway is, it does cut across a corner of the park, and and they're building rebuilding the driveway. It was on the plans, and even at the time, it goes across the boundary line on the plans into a small part of the park property. And so, like a resolution on that, because we're, if we're giving this land, if the council, if the borough is giving this land to this private enterprise, um, I, I think that needs to be sort of a publicly acknowledged thing. 
Um, we're not again about being bad neighbors here, but there there is something that just doesn't seem right because as John pointed out, pointed out, it's a lot of effort, a lot of decisions, a lot of work went into honestly and forthrightly negotiating uh, to acquire the park, as the council did for the borough. It's the borough's park, um, but it it uh, even today with heavy equipment moving in and out there. They're on the park, going on the driveway. On the driveway, and I, I watched reasonably carefully. Where's Keith? There he is. The, uh, um, and, and it stayed on the driveway, and it didn't damage anything that I could see, although it does run over the curb, where there's not a curb cut. Um, there's some pretty heavy stuff, but that will end when they do the new driveway. Just want to make sure that that new driveway, which is going to be built, is it, which is basically follows the footprint of the existing driveway, um, doesn't use parkland for that purpose. That is that a better statement? Okay. So I think we'd, what we'd like to do is have that. Now that we've seen they're actually going through with the thing which started, as it said, was it today or yesterday? Today, um, and coincidentally, we're meeting tonight. So therefore, we're here. That's the issue. I don't know if you have any questions about that. I will stop over and take a look at it, but I think the first step is to yeah. have the property corner. The, the zoning officer said to you and me, oh, it's a small thing. We're not going to worry about it. And so I don't know that that's a formal resolution. And I'd like a formal resolution to say the borough is not going to worry about parkland for a commercial enterprise. Thank you. Mayor De Baptiste. Thank you. I just wanted to say one thing in response to uh, uh, the statement made by the Parks and Recreation. Um, at the end of the day, the borough's park is Hoops Park. Hoops Park is the borough's park. Uh, the baseball team that meets there, I guess they've had this lease since 1956. I, I don't know the special arrangements about it but that's something I'll find out. However, at the end of the day, the borough owns Hoops Park and they are using the fields at the discretion of the borough. And so at this point, either they, we make them do the right thing in terms of the netting and everything else because they have had ample time to involuntarily do it through the years and have chosen not to. So that, and so consequently, you know, they have created a hazard in the neighborhood directly across from Hoops Park. We're impacted. And we're impacted because of poor planning. And that, that parking lot needs to be used. There's at least 20 spots, 10, 15, 20 spots that do not go used. So they park all around the perimeter of the park and the, and the basic parking lot is not used. Um, so come by one evening and see that and then see. Uh, and so, no, they are not kind. They are not respectful. They are not polite. They park on the street and park on both sides and they will uh, just last week they came up on my my uh, property and my neighbor's property. There was no request and I was standing right there when I looked up from my car got out my car. They were digging in my flower bed. Now, I don't know if you would appreciate that Bernie or Sheila or Patrick, if they were digging in your flower bed, but I certainly did not appreciate it. And I know my neighbor does not as well. And so this kind and gentle approach we've taken with this group, it needs to be a little firmer and a little stronger and they need to do the right thing. And it is up to the borough to suggest that to this group. You've taken the kind and gentle approach. In 20 some years, they have not done the right thing. And so now, either you hold them accountable or you relook at their ability to use Hoops Park and the Diamond Field. Thank you for your comments. 
Okay, moving on. Engineers reports. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> all right, I'll start with the uh, loud project, the roof. Construction started last week. Pannoni's out here a couple times a day when the contractors are here, uh, checking in on everything, holding them accountable. It's extremely loud. The roofers have extremely poor taste in music. So when there is a break from the sawing and the hammering and everything, <clears throat> uh, we got the music to contend with, but uh, you can you can hear it kind of like progress through the building, uh, whether ex with the exception of yesterday and even yesterday, <clears throat> they were out here for half a day hooking up roof drains. And uh, I'm happy to say that we had no water in here during that storm yesterday. Uh, it's the first time it's rained and we haven't had, you know, 20 buckets out in this building uh, since like a year. And uh, well, yeah. Yeah, well, I joked about sending them home today, but um, yeah, very excited uh, to be dry. We had some uh, few issues along the way. Uh, day one, a couple guys, they're hoisting materials up on the roof, a couple guys not wearing hard hats. Uh, we've had some debris on the ground, pretty uh, boiler, not boilerplate, pretty common stuff on a job like this. Um, we've addressed everything with the contractor or Pannoni's done it on our behalf and uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, the change that we need. So uh, nothing really unmanageable there. Um, if you're on the roof, Mr. Uh, Mr. Williams, is everybody ICC approved yet? Um, <clears throat> good question. Uh, so no, um, our mechanical contractor flunked the ICC, uh, mechanical subcontractor uh, flunked their ICC test. Um, <clears throat> according to them, uh, it is, uh, very, they're, they're a commercial mechanical contractor. The test is a pretty good split between residential work and commercial work. They did uh, extremely well on the commercial work, the work that they actually do, the work that we actually need. And uh, they were a little rusty on the residential stuff. Um, so they are uh, regrouping and they'll have a plan for us uh, later this week is what we've been told. Uh, again, those options are a uh, scope of work that doesn't require a permit, which doesn't require a uh, ICC certification, um, getting a different subcontractor, um, although that has implications for our responsible contractor ordinance. There's some due diligence we'd have to do on the sub before they could start and pull a permit. Um, and um, there's one other option there I'm blanking on. But um, <clears throat> they also, for the first time we found out today, they have their master's uh, mechanical license in the state of New Jersey. Um, we reciprocate with Philly, uh, if they have a master Philly license. <clears throat> um, so, you know, one question is, do we reciprocate with the state of New Jersey? I know the uh, state of New Jersey has a more challenging building code than Pennsylvania. So if you can work in Pennsylvania, if you can work in New Jersey um, and manage the code there, then you can. I'm sure our code enforcement officer will be able to tell us. Yeah. The, yeah. And I would, Suggest we do that sooner than later. Yeah, that's more important at, at this point. Yeah, so yeah. I'm taking the test over again. So, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's been a very uh, frustrating part of the of the project, and uh, so we'll, we'll work through it eventually. <clears throat> um, but yeah, until then, no mechanical work is being done, um, which again consists of lifting two of the nine units on the roof three inches. So, uh, we'll work through it. <clears throat> Um, I mentioned last month, it's grant season. We had two go in the last day of May, uh, one go in, uh, today, which was a DVRPC led effort going after federal dollars. I think 21 municipalities, uh, in the Southeast outside of Philadelphia signed on to that grant application. So, uh, we were one of the, uh, participants in that, um, Dr. Fork was here. I don't know if anyone was here for act, but Dr. Fork was here from the university. I'm um, talking about growing greener grant. Um, we're putting in for a Goose Creek stormwater best management practice, um, brick and mortar project there. Our engineers have both, both engineers have advised us that a brick and mortar project is the way to go. So we're leading with that. Um, and we're also, uh, later this month, uh, PennDOT signalized pedestrian infrastructure projects covering three locations. Um, <clears throat> we had six in mind. These are places where we have, um, known pedestrian, um, safety issues or like even like 
discomfort with the experience of trying to cross the street. So um, we came up with six. Um, it's important when writing grants that we're all comfortable with the match. And so we, we had to scale back that project into two phases. So phase one is going to be uh, Price Street, um, New Street and Gay Street, uh, where you come flying up Hannam Avenue or you're trying to um, uh, pass, uh, right by St. Agnes there, you're at the stop sign, you're looking this way down Hannam Avenue and you got a gap and you floor it. And then 20 feet later, there's someone scurrying across the street. I think we've all had a negative encounter at that intersection. And then the last one is um, High Street and Biddle Street, right by Westchester Friends. Um, so the commonality between these is unsignalized in at least one direction. Pedestrian, heavy pedestrian traffic, especially around community points of interest like Gay Street, St. Agnes, our borough parking lot across the street, up up there on Gay Street. And then, um, yeah, kiddos trying to cross the street uh, trying to cross High Street in the morning, especially when um, there's parking on both streets. Today there wasn't. I tried to get a picture today, but they're paving or something. So, but um, yeah, these are places where we need to do better to keep everyone safe. So, there's a grant going in for that at the end of the month, and RVE is doing a great job getting us ready for that. Um, <clears throat> Arlie Bradford uh, Pike project is winding down. Um, where push button pedestals need to be re relocated, um, basically confusion between the contractor and the plans. Um, so they're centering one on the pedestal and the one on the giant side is actually getting located where the plans called for in the first place on the other side of the retaining wall. So there's still some work to be done by the contractor there. Um, we had a site meeting May 25th. I again brought up the question of the curb. Uh, thank you for the picture that illustrated that. That was very helpful. Um, ran that past the engineer, ran that past PennDOT. They said, it's good. Uh, no, no cause for concerns amongst the, them. Um, I asked about tipping just the edge of the curve, and they said the curve is an extension of the sidewalk, and that's dictated by the same ADA slope requirements. So um, I'm not sure, you know, where else to go from that, but yeah, for what it's worth, it. Well, for what it's worth, it's in East Bradford too. So, <laughs> uh, Starbucks, because you didn't show up. Yeah, I stood up. Um, I took pictures and sent them to you. <laughs> you. I tried to get you there. Yeah, it's hard to tell when you're serious. <clears throat> um, High and Minor Street. Um, <clears throat> so this is another one we wanted to talk about today. If you'll recall from last month, we opened a bid for uh, April 28th. Sorry, two months ago now, um, and awarded. Yeah, so I'm sorry, bid was open April 28th at the May meetings, council awarded the bid to Premier Concrete. Um, they were issued a notice of intent to award as outlined in a responsible contractor ordinance the next week. Um, that document says they have 14 days, 14 business days to get us all their documentation. Today is business day 13. Um, we still haven't gotten everything we need. Uh, we did get a package about 4.30 today electronically with a bunch of stuff we were waiting on. So um, <clears throat> I'm not confident we have everything we need, but from here we're going to uh, give that to Remington and Burnick, who's going to help us validate what uh, um, their claims are that they've uh, uh, sworn to. Um, we'll have an update next week. If we're not satisfied, then the question is, uh, you know, where do we go and, and potentially uh, possibly um, rejecting the bid if need be. Um, so we're we're working on that, and we have a good partner with Remington and Burnick. Um, and lastly, the last thing I wanted to hit on here was rain gardens. Um, <clears throat> it's funny, kind of turned out to be a blessing in disguise. If I had my way, I would have planted May 1st. We then had the driest May in uh, the history of Westchester since records have been kept, which meant uh, Public Works has been doing a great job watering, but it's it's been really hard to keep up. We have lost some things that's anticipated whenever you plant anything. Uh, we got a lot of help yesterday and the 10 day looks good. Um, but the next page down, Billy, I think has some pictures of the plantings going in. Um, really, really happy with Arca Wild. They're the right contractor at the right time for a number of our projects. So uh, we're not done yet either. Um, we hit pause on the smaller ground cover going in until we get some rain, everything that's gone in so far has been 
Um, mostly the one to three gallon pots or those little half quart pots, but the plugs aren't going in until we're confident we have a, uh, enough rain to keep them alive. <laughs> so, anything else? No questions here. Cool. Thanks for your patience Thank you. with um, health department too. I told them 10 minutes, but it, obviously good information. So sorry they went a little long. I, I, I was so excited to see that fog machine. Yeah. I grew up with it. Yeah. We used to run behind it. Oh, that explains it. Yeah. <laughs> see, now you know. <laughs> okay, moving on to item 4B, discuss bat houses in the park. I told Sue that the bat houses don't get parking permits. And she told me they have batmobiles. Oh, no, I'll take that. We're doing that. Yeah, I'm off camera too, aren't you? All right. Yeah, okay. Um, so the really short version of all this is, is I have bats in my house most of my neighbors. So I started to look into evicting them, which discovered that you can't evict them at this time of the year because they're mating and it's a maternity ward in my attic. So in the meantime, though, I also discovered that we could, or thought about we could put bad houses in the parks, discovered that Chris and Keith have already been on this project and poor Chris had to go through hoops to get one installed at Hoops Park. Um, he went back and forth to Park Rec Rec Commission. He's been here, he's been there. Um, long and short of it is, I would love to have bat houses at Moss Cellar, Greenfield, speaking of water gardens. Uh, Public Works would be a great spot for one. So my request is to just have blanket approval to put these things up in the parks that request them to have our esteemed public works department install them and to make it really easy, simply have two or three designs which are acceptable. Um, somebody was suggesting um, the Boy Scouts could build them as a project. I don't know. Um, but I'm just, I'm really here to get blanket approval um have ins help installing them limit the number of designs and keep it really simple chris you want to add to that, What's that? you want to add to that i don't know if i can <laughs> we just uh yeah two eight years ago chris pugliese um 405 west ashbridge street i'm on the friends of hoops park and it's uh Sue mentioned that I sort of introduced the idea with a, co a couple other habitat improvement projects at Hoops, two of which the, uh, the uh, a screech owl box went in about a month, six weeks ago, perhaps, followed by the bad house. Yeah. So I think what I had a conversation with, with Sue. She called me when uh, she found out what we were doing because she's interested. I think she's interested in a in a maternity bat box. We did not do that at Hoop. Yeah. We did a roost box, um, which is not exactly the same thing. However, it, it's a you know bat friendly project. Yeah. Your I think your goal is uh, you know to rid the neighborhood of bats, <laughs> not rid the neighborhood of bats, but just relocate them. So. So I have no, um, since we didn't do a maternity house, I have no real input on design. You know, I'd be happy to help you with that if, if you'd like, but. There's, there are so many. Sorry. <clears throat> wow, bats. In essence, there are so many designs, so many price points. You can buy plans and somebody can cut them out and build it for you. You can buy kits, you can buy, buy pre-builds. Pricing is all over the place. So I thought it would be simpler if there were, you know, three or four approved designs, plans, sizes to limit, you know, having these things of various sizes all over the place and escalating. 
Um, I think the other thing to think about is there's probably a couple of places that should not have bat houses. John and Green Park would come to mind. Um, but in essence, just looking to get blanket approval, get some planning underway, because they should go up in August, September at the latest, because bats migrate. So when everybody leaves the neighborhood this fall, they're going to come back in the spring to where they used to live. And hopefully by then we will have sealed all that off. So we need to get stuff in place for late for fall when babies start moving out on their own and when the adults vacate for the season. So if I could just ask questions, so between the, the Parks and Rec Commission and the Parks and Rec Department and Public Works, do you have a plan together or is... Um, currently, no. This uh, The only plan was for Hoops Park. Uh, there have been several other parks that I've inquired and I put Chris in touch with some of those folks. Um, just hearing more about this, I mean, it's a potential uh, leaping off point to maybe get involved with the Chester County Health Department or maybe something they're doing and then also maybe involving to not put this, you know, I, I don't call it burden, but not put this this job upon public works. We could bring in juvenile probation or something along those lines to create the bad houses to make them literally probably at, at next to nothing. Uh, I'd have to do more research into that in the next month or so to, to kind of figure those things out. But I think the the point of having a a one or two approved idea, it would still have to come through obviously this committee to say, okay, we're, we're okay. But again, I don't know if they, I don't know much about bats. So I don't know which parks are gonna be better served than others, uh, but it's something we can look into. I think Chester County may have more information for us. Yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed at all to doing it, but I think uh, a plan would be appropriate to come back and say, you yeah, know, here's what units we'd use and what parks would be appropriate. I know a very tiny bit about bats and I'm in support of this 100%. I think it would help with the whole mosquito issue. I think it would be a really wonderful thing for everybody to have these things sort of in the space and in our in our life. But um, I definitely want a consistent thing going on. I would like a cohesive plan and I would love to see like what is being asked, maybe three options that make sense for various reasons and then move forward with only those three options in a very strategic way. Um, so yes, please. I'll, I can, I'll take the lead with this uh, and, and get in touch with uh, the county and juvenile probation to see where we can do moving forward. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate it. Item number 4C, discuss practice of striping long lines on borough roads. I believe this is probably in reference to my question last month about North Walnut, North Matlack, et cetera. Would you like to kick it off or would you like me to do it? Well, the, the question came up from some you know, residents in, in my ward who, you know, pointed out the fact that these are two roads that were paved last year, um, if not the year before, I don't really recall. And I never honestly really noticed it, but they have no markings whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And then it occurred to me recently that now I know why I have some people that look at me like I have, you know, 10 feet or something when I'm coming down a road and they're coming down like my side, like they think it's a one way street or something. Yeah. I asked you to, what is the, I would assume that would just be sort of standard specification. You're repaving a road, you got to remark it. Sure. Um, well, I, I probably should start with our standard practices to restripe whatever was there before. And if there's nothing there before, we just leave it alone. And it sounds like maybe we want to reconsider that. Well, I mean, I think the issue is, and I don't know if RVE, you know, could weigh on this, but I, I think just from a, you know, the MUTCD, the, the standard practice for roadways, yeah. you have to mark a road. I mean, whether it was done before or not, I, I don't, I don't say I don't care, but yeah. it, it's, they need to be marked. Um, okay. And if that's a, a standard of, Pen dot or just good practice, and we should be doing it. Okay, um, we're part of a consortium uh, with other municipalities around us for um, striping roads. Um, we did not do any with the paving project for 2023, just because we follow that same practice that I was telling you. Um, 
but we can, um, you know, happily do whatever you want. There's obviously a cost that that comes with it. So, well, I think the other thing is I'd like the police department to weigh on this. I mean, okay. I feel like we're putting the the borough at risk from a liability perspective. Somebody has an accident, they sue everyone, and they say, "Well, the borough." The road wasn't marked. Standard for any new road is that you have, you know, two solid yellow lines okay. dividing the, the lanes. So, yeah, it may be money spent, but it's insurance money. I, I don't think it makes any sense whatsoever not to do what standard best practice is. Understand. Uh, I think what I would suggest, if um, I would like to talk to the police department and uh, maybe start out with roads that they think is are um, most risky. Uh, and then um, get that, and then we can uh, come up with a cost and, and go from there, or just do it. Yeah, uh, our line striping crew, if they change the tip in the line striper, we'll get a much crisper line because you're supposed to change those tips every 100 gallons. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, they're block filler tips at this point. They're about that wide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get a good two inch, four inch line. I'm confident that our guys. Uh, can lay a chalk line okay. and walk a chalk line because uh, I mean, the, 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 now that's a pretty long thing by by um, uh, Marshall Square Park. It's, it's a mm -hmm. and uh, those guys aren't with the trucks aren't always the the straightest. Okay, they're pretty good. Yeah, but they're not they're not always the straightest. Okay. Uh, I, I wouldn't underestimate the quality of our our guys because they okay. they do they do a good job uh, with it when they need to do it. And yeah. uh, all right, and and uh, it. you know it, it can't be that bad, you know, because you know if you lay it out for them because you're an engineer, lay it out with the way they see the guys doing it on Market Street, we could do it. Okay, yeah, we're, we're capable. We'll do almost anything. Sure, so especially especially with a little awesome. training, right? That, that's all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, start in Hoops Park and start relining Hoops Park and you practice. Because uh, the, those lines are faded. That, okay. that way you get used to it. So, okay. Yeah, I agree, Mr. McCoy. Though uh, up there in that area, uh, you, it, 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 it's a dividing point that you don't know where you're you're really at. So, unless, if you're a local, I, I don't know that it's true. For I haven't driven all the boroughs' roads to look at what's what's been done or or not done. They're obviously the ones I'm most familiar with. Um, but I think just general practice, we should be. Yeah. Probably I, marking the roadways. I suspect that the vast majority of roads are not marked right now. Uh, and for that reason, I, I um, just going with what you recommended. I'd like to talk to the police to. And I think even RVE should be part of that conversation. There are okay. traffic consultants and. Um, okay. they should be telling us the appropriate markings to be putting okay. on different roads. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I'm, I just want to say what the roads down near me, most of them are not. Or many of them are not marked, mm -hmm. and there is sort of a cultural understanding of how those roads work, which is bizarre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know how you're going to mark those roads that have parking on both sides, sort of, and and it's kind of a one lane road, but it's two way. <laughs> but but as a start, when we're repaving a road, yeah. it it should be done. All of them. Got it. I we'll think do. this is a good idea. I just think it's a. It's yeah. a, I think RVE is very important in this. Got it. We'll, we'll do all that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Finally, moving on to some action items here. Item A approve Oregon tree experts for the Emerald Ash Borer Treatment Program with a bid of $23,472. Um, you should have a memo. Uh, we received four bids, uh, they were competitive. Um, um, the, the low bidder, Horgan Tree Experts, was um, uh, their bid was responsive, and uh, my recommendation is that you approve um, a contract to them. I have no questions. I approve. It's an easy one. <laughs> All right, sounds like a 3 0. And uh, item B approved Delaware Valley Paving. For the 2023 borough paving contract with a bid of $526,969.05. Okay. So we received four bids. Um, they were competitive. Uh, uh, the low bid is under our budget. Um, the low bidders bid documents were responsive. 
and I recommended uh, approval of the contract, but I know Mr. Flynn has concerns. Uh, doing my due diligence on the, 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 the contractor, I supplied Mr. Metric and Mr. Edwards with, uh, and with documentation on the uh, uh, customer service and complaints from the existing low bidder. And I asked Mr. Edwards to take a look into it before we recommend uh, the situation because uh, there's a sizable amount of complaints that they've had uh, with uh, with customers as well as the Department of Transportation. And uh, and also we're not sure whether they uh, uh, fit the uh, RCO yet from the, the state of uh, Pennsylvania. So we're waiting on that as well. But the uh, uh, also what happens with the $526,000, that pretty much exhausts our uh, liquid fuels budget. And in the event that we have uh, snow in 2023, or hopefully we have money somewhere else because we won't have any money to uh, plow the roads because that'll eliminate all of our money because more than paving comes out of liquid fuels. And Mr. Evers could probably tell you there's four or five different things that come out of liquid fuels money. And if we use it all up uh, doing the, the, the paving, we're leaving ourselves uh, open with uh, some overextended line items. This was a low bid, though, correct? Yeah, low bid. But, but uh, I gave uh, well, I gave you a copy of it as well, Mr. McCoy. The uh, the complaint list and the customer service thing earlier this evening. So, so he's going to do his due diligence, hopefully, to see if uh, uh, we can rectify the situation. So, so we'll move this to discussion work session. Uh, what I would suggest is you push it off a month. Um, we have 60 days from bid opening to award a contract or reject the contract, uh, reject the bids. Um, so um, I think a full month would give us um, more time and better time to to see what's up. Yeah, all that impact of yeah. the paving project. So, well, uh, the 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 bid requires them to be finished within 90 days. Um, so if we open bids in July, awarded in July, paperwork will be done August. So August, September, October, um, you know, it's doable. Um, it, it's also doable if we properly advise PennDOT that we may be going long, might be going into October. That's where we failed the last time. So I, I, I think it's doable. But, you know, I, I'll just leave it, you know, how you all want to handle it, right? Yeah, it, 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 you had a chance to read the, the information. I, I mean, you haven't digested it yet. It, well, I, I, I have a little bit. Um, I mean, I guess my only comment was I, I would not, you know, any business of any size probably gets sued multiple times per year by somebody going after um, anything, and they bring in lots of defendants. So I'm not sure that I would judge them by... Um, by this, I think, you know, well, obviously well, we have procedures yeah. to go through from a bidding contract yeah. perspective. So let's do our due, due diligence and sure. Yeah, what, what it says in our bidding contract, I was talking to Mr. Edwards about it. It says, and neither one of us could remember the, uh, the amount of years, uh, it's either three to five years. Have you been sued or uh, have you been sued within three or five years? And they're supposed to disclose that. And he's, he's got the, the paperwork to take a look to see through it. Now I've given them the, the documentation and he'll see, see if it works. So just want to make sure that you know, we don't have any issues. That's yeah. all. I will say, and, and probably you know this is maybe better than I do, but the, the bar is set really high for not taking the low bidder. So I just want to kind of put some reality on that. That probably should come from the solicitor, but that's my experience. Well, if we take Glasgow, we really won't have any anything snow removal money. <laughs> so, yeah. th although it is seventeen thousand, eighteen thousand dollars more, mm -hmm. but hopefully the, the, the low bidder will meet all the requirements and uh, uh, and, and we'll move forward. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. I I would. Is it possible to to have more information by yeah. work session? Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. I prefer not to potentially delay the paving till October or November. Hey, well, I'll, we'll, uh, 
Yes. I am now for sure it, in a shorter time. That's all. I just want to clarify too, just with the RCO, it's uh, as someone who gets a lot of notices in the mail about how we get sued the borough. Uh, it's not just the act of being put on notice that you're subject to a lawsuit that is in the RCO. You have to be um, uh, found in violation of law applicable to contracting businesses. You've had to have your license revoked. There's certain things that have to have happened. It's not just simply the act of getting put on notice by someone that you're being sued because we, we get those all the time. I, get, I see those all the time. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, I think the last item is approval of last month's meeting minutes. Approved. And this meeting is adjourned at eight. I assume it's eight, eight, uh, 37.